Ready to go? Lovely. Hello, everyone. This packed audience of individuals, you lovely people. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Tim Green. I'm a, a journalist and an analyst, and I've been writing about mobile and technology for about 10 or 15 years now. And um, in this session, I'm going to be talking to Nigel Tatlock, who's the director of um, SEE Engagement. And he's going to be telling us a little bit about um, a case study of um, using virtual ticketing and virtual entry in the real world. So it's a kind of interesting uh, case study around bringing together the best of digital and real world. But before we do that, I'm going to just indulge myself a little bit and do a short presentation on something that I personally find pretty interesting, and I'm hoping that you will too. It's, uh, it's an idea which could change the world, could go nowhere. But I think it's interesting anyway, and it's various names. But one of the names that is emerging is the Internet of Me. And it's a new way for brands and enterprises to talk to customers. It's also called sometimes personal data economy, information economy, intention economy, H and the, uh, the API of me. You might see any of these when it's being discussed. And what is it? Well, if you think about it, when we're exchanging data with digital organizations, we're sending out lots of information about ourselves. And there's too many of me. So there's the, the online shopper me that's registering my details with Amazon, the social media me on Facebook, uh, patient, cardholder, adulterer, um, <clears throat> and, and, and any number of others um, that you could mention. And uh, this is probably out of date now, but the average UK customer has 118 accounts. And that's bad for us because I don't know where all my data is. I don't know who's got it. I don't know what they're doing with it. Um, never mind GDPR. It still doesn't really, hasn't really, really solved the problem at all. So what's wrong with having data in so many places? Well, apart from the privacy and security issues, the data's siloed. So, you know, I've got my, my bank details over here, um, but I've got my shopping details, and my browsing details over here. And I might want someone that I trust to be able to so, um, to bring all those together in order to bring me a better service. But they're all dispersed and in different places. And quite often the data is incomplete too. So I might have changed address or I might have uh, changed my bank. But every time I do want to change my details with any of these brands, it's a massive pain in the ass. So, yeah, so the data is wrong. So therefore, you know, you get cases like with the, the uh, adultery website where, you know, most of the people on there aren't even people, they're, they're bots, or the people who say they're women are actually men, and so on and so on. And a lot of the time, these organizations are gathering data on you, and, it's, and they're not even very good at using it. So we've all, we've all had this experience where we go onto Amazon, and they're trying to sell us something that we've already bought. When it works, though, it's creepy because we're like freaked out by the fact that um, these organizations seem to know what we want. So you get this kind of thing. And as I kind of intimated and hinted, it's also a hassle. So if I want to change my details anywhere, then like, you know, I change my bank, for example. How many sites have I got to change it with? You know, it's a nightmare remembering that Amazon, eBay, PayPal, Everybody, everywhere I've got my bank details registered, I have to move it and change it. And so that's why every time you get into a new site, you get this nightmare. But it's bad for the companies as well, because in order to store your details, they need massive servers. They run the risk of um, data breaches because they've got all your information. We all know about that. With all the new regulation that's coming, they need lawyers because they're protecting, they're obviously safeguarding a lot of private information. And so you get this situation where, as I say, they're either doing it well and it's creepy or they're doing it badly and it's shit. There doesn't seem to be any alternative to those two. Meanwhile, we're not really loyal. Uh, so when, we, when companies ask for our data and then they claim it's all about loyalty, it's not really. So you get this situation. So really what we need is we need one place for all of our data, everything from our browsing uh, habits to our shopping, to our payment data, or even our biometrics. 
So what's, where's the best place to store that data? Well, these guys are all trying to get us to sign in across multiple sites and become some kind of custodian of our data, but I don't think any of us trust any of them. So there's only one logical, logical place, and that's me and you. So if there was some way that I could store all my data safely in one place and exchange it with brands under my terms, then I think we'd all benefit. So this is an idea that first came to light with this guy called Doc Searles. And he, he put this idea out there about 2012. And, and it's just this big idea that we, we take control of our data and we share it with enterprises and brands on our terms. And that way, we get all the benefits of personalization and discounts and so on. But we don't have all the worry of, of people taking our data and us not knowing what they're doing with it. So he called this the intention economy, which is a, the opposite of the attention economy. Another idea that he put out there was something called vendor relationship management. So in this situation, because I have all the power and I have all the data, I could, in a sense, say, right, I want to buy a new um, you know, stroller for my baby. And I put the information out there. And all the companies that are interested in making me some kind of offer could compete for my, for my uh, custom because they can all get to see who I am and what, what my needs are. And another word for it is intent casting. So doc sales was a bit early, but things are changing now because people are starting to get more freaked out by the whole data privacy thing. So you have the Cambridge Analytica and the fake news and there's all the ad blockers. I mean, this is out of, out of date now, but you can imagine with ad blockers how much more um, installed they are than in this. And also some of the big advertisers are getting a bit freaked out by it as well. So this is what Doc, Doc Searle says. He, he said that we need to have um, places where we can keep our data. And the important thing is that it's going to be... Oh, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're going to need microphones as well as data. <laughs> so we're going to need protocols so that we can bring together... Anyone who wants to come and find our data has a sort of easy way of doing it. So when he came up with this idea, there weren't anyone that was really doing it. It was just all a sort of philosophical idea. But now there are these companies called PIMS. So if you Google PIMS, you'll start to see what this idea is all about. So there's companies like there's People.io, DataQ, Citizen Me, Miko, Cozy Cloud, they're French, Digime. And Digime is probably the most interesting of them all. Because if you're interested in this, check this company out. Because the guy who's running it is very, he's a very good showman. So he explains the principle really well. So if you go onto YouTube and type this, this company in, it'll explain it well. So what they have is they have an app that you can download from the App Store. And you can put various bits of data in there, whether it's emails, bio, biometric data. And you can give it permission to pull in data from other sources. So if you have a banking app on your phone, it can pull that information in. There's all sorts of stuff about how they secure it and everything. But the, point, the, the key point is what they're building towards is encouraging you to have this repository of all your information and then sending out the, the, the uh, protocols to external organizations so that they can come in and they can go into your DigiMe app and they can find the information they need without taking it out. They can just look at it and then they can make assumptions and do things based on what that data tells them. So what they say is they're replacing intermediaries with protocols. So the example they always give is insurance. And again, this is not something I don't think they can do yet, but this is a kind of idea that makes it real for you, which is that if you have an insurance claim, let's say, at the moment, your insurer would need to write to you. And then they would say, can you produce some medical documents to prove you're injured? And can you give us a police report? And can you give us your bank details and all this sort of stuff? And probably someone would fax the hospital and they would fax back the information. And the whole thing would cost hundreds of pounds and take days, weeks, months. In this dream scenario that DigiMe has got, the insurance company already uses DigiMe's protocols. They just ping my app and they say, is it OK if we interrogate DigiMe to process this claim? I say yes. Their app interacts with the DigiMe app. It pulls all the information it needs because it's got your medical records on there. It's got your police records on there. It's got your payment records on there. It makes an instant, instant calculation. And then in seconds, it's processed the claim. 
So the, the insurance company has saved hundreds of pounds and lots of man hours, and you've saved a lot of grief as well. And meanwhile, DigiMe, they don't, they're not transferring any data at all. All they're doing is making protocols so that these two sets can interrogate each other. And they take pennies on that transaction. So that's their vision. Now, I don't know, this all might be bullshit. You might go away and remember this in a few years' time. Remember that funny bloke from England who said that crappy thing about that never happened. But it could change the world, and I think it's a very interesting uh, new idea. And so the, the other big thing um, that they take out of this is that these guys who are evangelizing this new idea, so it takes away the data advantage. So at the moment, Facebook and Google, et cetera, have got a big advantage on any smaller trader because they ha do have certain amount of information on you. But if I'm sharing the information that I've got on me with anyone I want, then that data advantage goes away. And no, none other than Tim Berners-Lee is interested in this. And he's just launched a new protocol called Solid. I'm not a technical person. I don't really understand it. But it's, it's, it's a, a lot to do with reinventing the underlying technology and the internet in order to make these kinds of ideas happen. So anyway, that's uh, my um, introduction to this idea that intrigues me so much. There are my details. I hope you enjoyed it. And now on to part two, where I'm going to introduce Nigel Tatlock. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about harnessing the power of digital in the real world. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm afraid mine won't be as in-depth as Tim's in technology. It's uh, what we're actually oh, going to talk about is uh, an actual case study that we've got live in North America. And the, and the last presentation that came on was by uh, an organization supporting Bitcoin. And they were kicking 10 bells out of Visa and MasterCard. So I'm going to open this session by telling you we are an accredited MasterCard partner. Um, and what that actually means to us is we, we take a lot of sports and entertainment properties to MasterCard. And that could run in the form of payment. It could be in the form of engagement. Um, but it's a relationship that, quite frankly, opens doors into brands that you would never normally get the, the ability to go and talk to. We have three products under the group label uh, sports week sports locker and sports tv news that's just to give you some uh, back uh, in-depth information we're an accredited broadcaster we have the same rights as sky bbc itv fox itanta we actually curate content distribute it globally we've got now i think 11 uh video on demand channels globally at this time we, we provide digital assets to grassroots sport, and that's what I'm going to come on to. This is the opportunity that we're going to talk about more in depth. We're a provider of turnkey solutions, so anyone that engages with us, they can either take content or through to applications. We also have worldwide rights for everything we produce. There, is no, there are no territory restrictions. However, we do have holdbacks in line with FIFA, UEFA accreditation. We have direct consumer mobile channels. So that's a little bit about C. So that hopefully gives you a bit of a flavor. This was the opportunity that we're going to talk about. It's a sporting company that has 29 stadiums in North America. They have touch points with millions of players and families daily. And when I say daily, these facilities are heaving from morning to around about midnight, playing various sports such as football or as our Americans call it, soccer, uh, basketball, volleyball, beach volleyball, baseball. The range ranges are there. They actually pay between five to fifteen thousand dollars a year to play their chosen sport. It's a very affluent market for us to be in. They have daily marketing communications going out, and before we met them, they never actually understood or could even profile their consumers, their players, their buying habits. So monetization and media just 
didn't mean anything to them. They had no concept. They'd never made any additional funds out of these players other than their fees and their apparel contracts and no digital assets. So this is what we actually did for these guys. And I've just taken a, one of the entities here. We, des we developed mobile applications for them and they're available in iOS and Android. That gives them the ability to work with their sponsors, promote, engage with their consumers on a daily basis, also their sponsors, which is very important. We redesigned all of their websites, their digital assets. So we installed Wi-Fi into all of the stadiums as you walk through the stadium. Impact testing. We work with a company called Impact who are concussion-based testing. And that's quite important in sport today. There's a lot of talk about head injuries. So we run all of the technology that support those tests in Europe. Payment instruments. We brought a payment program together, which was a credit card, a wristband and a mobile wallet. And that's what the children use today. Videos, content, I'll go on to how they, we engage with them. And then we've kitted out the facilities with TV monitors. So every digital touch point within those facilities we, we produce. And we help them brand, which is very important. So the brand value to the, to the owners, just to give you a couple of headline numbers, we reduced their operating costs by 12%, which is significant when you're talking about a business and I'll show you some of the numbers at the end. They are significant. I mean, seriously. So that 12% is a hike in profitability. Cashless stadiums increase revenues by 15%. It's a proven fact. People spend more. Uh, they get revenue share across everything we do. So it enhances their bottom line in, in many ways. So they have three, four bites of the cherries. And also they have an enhanced customer experience because they're engaging with their fans and they're giving them information that's relevant. This is a normal trip to one of their stadiums. I'm not going to teach you guys how to suck eggs. You've seen all this before. You talk about vouchers, digital access. But these are the points where we actually try and get the, the players, the families to use their com uh, club credit card or prepaid card to spend money. And that's exactly what we do. Then we use this particular information to profile these people and everything that they do within those stadiums, we own the technology for. And these are some of the um, assets that we have. So we have door entry systems, ticketing, concession stands are all contactless. Their retail stores online and in the store we run in conjunction with a company called Fanatics. All the club fees are paid through their credit card. Uh, online club spend is paid for. Apparel, so they spend on average a player around about $400 a year to, to buy their sporting goods. We capture that. Travel, these clubs travel the length and breadth of North America. And if you ever speak to one of the parents of the players, the holy grail is to get into a college, an Ivy League college. They, they take their holidays to support their children. You're smiling, sir, so I assume you're American. There we go. And it's an open loop, pay, open loop payment product. And what that basically means is it's not just utilized within the facilities that we have with them. They can use it in Starbucks and Costa and make money. So moving on. All of this is driven by content, and this is one of the things that I don't think people pay enough attention to. Passion drives spend. And I'm just going to show you a video of some of the assets we have. It's about three, three minutes long. This gentleman will like the first parts because it's American.
起来看。So the, the reason why we use content in this particular program is we have the application, so we touch um, the consumer on a daily basis. And what we start to understand is children that play volleyball have another sport that they're passionate about. It could be baseball, could be NFL, could be football, whatever it is. But by actually serving them meaningful, relevant content on a daily basis and attaching that to a payment product it drives consumer spend it drives loyalty so we actually take a great deal of time to study all the analytics that come in we will and we will do things that you guys have been doing for many years which is understanding the behavioral habits of the individual and actually linking an offer with the content so one of our partners in this program is a company called Kit Bagu, I'm sure you'll know. It's a relevant offer because it's sporting. We're, we're engaged with sporting brands, so they get a discount voucher. That discount voucher is only good if they use our payment product. Um, they can get a 25% off. They get end of range offers, end of season stocks. Other areas that we help to get people to spend money in, in a virtual world is we have 28 day promotions. People always ask me why you go leave with the, uh, the small subscription basis to, to start with. And, th and the, the reasoning for that is at this particular point, you don't have huge revenues coming into the business. So you've got to be very mindful of the fact that when you start giving away World Cup tickets with com accommodation, that's the best part of about 15 to 20,000 pounds. So you really need to make sure your, your base is spending. And it's content that drives it. Content drives that spend because we will send, if it's a World Cup, which is the Holy Grail, we had FIFA um, rights for the World Cup. We would send them relevant information about their chosen football team. So the passion drives spend, drives revenues for the club, and we don't forget mum and dad either. So we have a whole host of awards that mum and dad, who are normally responsible for that spend to give them access to money can't buy experiences, such as Elton John's after show party at the Oscars. We intend to get two tickets for that. We also have the, the, uh, the beauty of being a MasterCard accredited partner. So we have the priceless assets as well, which are quite rewarding. That's money off hotel vouchers. People always say to me, how much is this business worth? There's your answer. And it's not my money, Adam, before you start smirking. Um, so it, these guys spend on a kit alone over 25 uh, facilities over a year, close to a billion dollars. It's a significant amount of revenue. And what you need to understand is each transaction that goes through that credit card processing platform that we put in place with them with the bank they're making a healthy margin and it's a, it's a serious seven-figured number they've you know that the americans fly and stay in hotels at these venues in chicago there was 2,000 hotel rooms booked out for children's volleyball you just wouldn't get that in the uk i mean it's just it's unheard of and with all the loyalty and rewards, each of their particular customers is worth $34 incremental revenue to them a year. That becomes a significant number. And that's through ticketing, it's through um, advertising and reward programs. 
And if you want to know anything else, we're at stand 10. Feel free to pop round. If you want to talk content, payment, programs, virtual ticketing, quite happy to do so. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Nigel. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Um, so um, let's go back to basics. So you've got this, this vast American weird volleyball association, something that uh, over they, here they, we they don't play, really get it at all. Sport, yeah. And they're all spending a huge amount of money. Yeah, this gentleman will support that. And it's all offline. Um, so first of all, how did you kind of come to be working with this organization? And did you have to sell them the idea or were they coming to you saying, we're aware that everything we do is offline. How do we digitize it? It's a good question. Um, we, we're very close to sporting uh, entities and sporting individuals. So one of the, um, well, two of the guys that are actually involved in this business that sit on the board are ex-sports um, football professionals. So they put some of their own money into it. And one of them you actually saw on one of the clips, Stephen Gerrard. So Stephen actually approached me and said, we're building a golf course in Liverpool with a hotel facilities. We're putting 19 pitches down. Would you like to film the rights and see if you could help us monetize them and find some sponsors? Well, I'm not a sponsorship salesperson, but I could see the value in what they're doing within the sporting arena. It wasn't very difficult in terms of selling to them. They wanted to do it. I think the, the difficult aspect was how were we going to manage the enormity of the project? I think that was the hardest part. And anyone that's ever worked with sporting brands, they are the most dysfunctional business in the world. And so, um, so you built this um, sort of digital ecosystem. Am I correct in thinking that it all, uh, the center of it is the app that you developed? Is that how you communicate with all of the, the parents and the kids? Well, we, we use traditional methods as well. So we do use the likes of email, dare I say. So when email goes out, we started to uh, find partners on travel. So the, the emails have travel partners on there where they get a commission for anything being booked. But the app is certainly the thing when a lot of people come into a, into a city, they want to know where to eat, what to, what's the best restaurant, state restaurant, hotel, can they get a money off coupon? So we try and localize the, the offers so if someone comes into Dallas, they get that offers that are relevant. But it's all on the basis that they have to use their MasterCard. Right. And so you said that um, a lot of the revenue is driven around, is, is built around content. So is that content being delivered through the app? Is that how it works? It is, yes. Everything we do is, is app driven there. So we, we, what we, we need to understand with the, the players themselves is the coaches look after maybe 10 teams of a, of a certain age group. And it's like herding cats at the best of time. You got children, you know full well, it's very difficult to keep them in check. But some of these, these teams, they have on average 18 players. So the easiest way is mass communication and then talk to the ones that don't acknowledge it. And you said you reduced cost by 12%, is that right? We did. So how, do, how does that work? What, where, which costs were you reducing and how, how did it work? Well, banking is always a big cost. These guys were taking cash to the bank each each week. Um, very archaic checks were still, still quite big in North America. Um, so checks were coming through the post. Wastage, which is a nice way of putting it, uh, from the concession stands and the retail stores. It stops a lot of wastage. And it also helped them with their collection rates. So their collection rates reduce because when the child walks into the facility, they have to touch a monitor to say they're in the facility so they know where they are, which is um, if anything should happen to that child, they're covered. But the second thing is 
if they haven't paid their dues or the mothers forgot to pay their dues, they're sent upstairs to the to the office, and mum has to right. write a check. And um, how do you personalise the experience for each user? So if if content drives a lot of purchases, then clearly you need to send the right content to the right people. Are you personalising it, or do you just sort of send out mass mass uh, mailings? It's it's pretty much basic. When you sign up for the the app, we uh, we know who you are. So we get a lot of data from the facilities that we put in there. So we know if they're a right left-handed volleyball player, football left or right foot. And then they have the option to, to select from a menu what content they would like to receive. And all of a sudden, you, you, very quickly, you'll, you'll profile these people. So if someone is looking at Neymar or Mbappe from PSG, we would not start giving them Wayne Rooney from DC United. It's pointless. And when you first rolled this out, how did you uh, make everybody aware of, of what you were doing? Because it's not like you've got one organization and maybe one central authority that can tell everyone. It's still quite dispersed, I would imagine. So how did you roll it out? That's very much um, a partnership with the facility, the coaches and managers. And also, I've got to say, MasterCard, contrary to what that last group said, they put money behind these programs. So they would support it with marketing funds. So we, we, we had people in that each facility for a period of six weeks educating the players, the parents, how to use the technology, the value it was for the, for the brand, how the club would benefit. It reduces the parents' cost as well because the more money the club takes elsewhere, they're starting to give parents some money back. And I do, I feel sorry for American mums and dads. There's one, there's one family at one facility, and I spoke to this gentleman. He's paying thirty-eight thousand pounds, not dollars, pounds a year for three of his children to play sport. It's a ridiculous sum of money, but they pay it. Amazing. USA. Um, so, um, <laughs> has anyone got any questions? So, with that chorus of <laughs> USA, um, let's make America great again. I'm glad you're doing Thanks. your bit to, to help in that process. We'll, um, we'll finish there. We've got 15 minutes till the next session. So, thank you very much, everybody, for thank listening you. and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank, thank you. you, Nigel. Thanks.